So welcome to the Marine Researchers Breakout. Um, so <clears throat> just to kind of get the conversation started, I thought I would give a couple of concrete examples about how Embari and the Video Lab is using AI. Um, and then after I do that, Angus is going to talk about uh, Fathom GPT a little bit more. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to hand it over to Giovanna and let her talk about how we could use some of your help. Sure thing. Hi, well, I'm Giovanna and I'm a research assistant at Ambari. Um, and yeah, I wanted to start out by um, kind of giving a little call out where um, the Ocean Vision AI team and the FathomNet team are hoping to enlist the support of taxonomists um, to create short video lessons about identifying taxonomic groups um, that they're most familiar with. So based on images and video. And so we have a form here, a form of interest, which I will link in the chat. Um, and it gives a little bit more details on, um, on like uh, the videos themselves. But these videos um, will be hosted by OVAI as a resource for users to learn a little bit more about how to identify and to classify marine organisms. And so the videos, um, you know, should be medium length, 15 to 45 minutes. And we're hoping that, um, you know, you experts could explain the major um, morphological differences between um, different taxonomic groups. And so these will be uh, used to train other marine scientists and um, on how to better uh, differentiate a lot of these animal groups. Um, and so um, these videos will be publicly available and, um, you know, can be used in classes. Um, or um, can be shared with anyone to provide um, help on how to identify some of these marine animals. And um, yeah, they would be hosted on our YouTube channel and um, Connie can kind of jump in a little bit here, but um, we're also hoping to use them as a resource for the Fathomverse game to also teach and, and educate folks who want to learn a little bit more about the animals that they're IDing. Um, so yeah, this is a really exciting collaboration that we're really hoping that um, that folks can help us with. Yeah, Kakani, if I left anything behind, please feel free to, to chime in. All right, great. Thank you so much. So um, everybody, please feel free to jump in and ask questions or make comments as we're going through this. This should be pretty informal. I think the whole point here is to just sort of have a conversation about how you see yourself using AI and how FathomNet can be useful to your work and how we can help you. And I think everybody's seen that great video in the background there of this is what we we're all hoping for. <laughs> um, but to start off, we'll just talk about some, um, some of the uh, concrete examples that we're using at Ambari. First, I'm gonna talk about our VARS machine learning workflow. And we'll talk about some of the tools that we've used for, or that we've generated for um, creating localized data and processing videos with these models and uh, for validating those machine learning proposals. But first I thought we'd just start with, just so we're all on the same page, everybody knows what a localized image is. So for Embari, this is just a typical annotation. Um, and so it's basically these things were seen in this image at this time on this dive. Uh, but localized data, which is used for training machine learning models, uh, has to have boxes drawn around each one of those objects. And each one of those objects, we really need about, you know, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 of each one of those to really successfully train these machine learning models. And so one of the first things that we did was develop the VARS Localize tool. And VARS Localize allows us to search through existing images at Embari in the VARS database. And um, we can search for a given species or whatever it happens to be, um, genus or family, bring up all those images and then start drawing those boxes around the uh, object of interest, but then also other things that are seen in that frame as well. And um, just so people have an idea, we have about 10 million annotations in the VARS database and about 500,000 images that we can quickly draw from. Regardless, once you have some training data, you can up the, upload that to the cloud where we do uh, our, our training of these machine learning models. 
you know, they're fast GPU access and pretty cost effective. Um, we typically are training with YOLO V5 or YOLO V8 uh, that are produced by Ultralytics. Regardless, again, of how you do this or where you do this, the end result of training is that you have a model weights file. And uh, those are the files that we're sharing with you guys on the Hugging Face uh, website, the model zoo. Um, and once we have a model weight, we can basically send video or still images up to the cloud and uh, process those videos using that machine learning model. We can also do that on local hardware, and I'll give you some examples of that in, in just a little bit. But uh, once we process, we basically are generating proposals, machine learning proposals. In our case, we retrieve those proposals, which are actually tracks because we're using tracking to track things through space and time. We filter those so that each track is reduced down to the best observation of that particular animal on the track. And then that's imported into VARs. So for each one of those tracks, we actually just have one observation. And then humans validate those machine learning proposals within VARs using VARs and a video player called Shark Dakota 2, which I'll show you in a second, and or um, another tool that we've called GridView. And just to sort of get back to this idea real quick um, that might become apparent here, there's a bit of a feedback loop here where you can use training data, either human generated or human validated machine learning proposals to train a model. You use that trained model on new data and generate new proposals. And then you train a new model and that cycle continues and continues with the goal being really that human time decreases and the model performance improves. And we actually saw this sort of happen um, as we were doing this work, when we initially started, uh, we used GridView to manually create, or excuse me, uh, VARS Localized to manually create those initial 100,000 localizations. And that took about a year and a half. And then we used some machine learning assisted processes to generate another 200,000. And that took about six months. And then we've recently generated another 137,000. And that only took four months. Again, so this machine learning pipeline is really making that a much faster process, increasing the model performance and decreasing the human time. So again, some of these tools that we've developed, um, we've got a video player that works with VARS, which is our annotation software. And we can actually use VARs to generate training data. So as we're watching video, we can pause on a frame and start drawing boxes around the objects that we're seeing there and labeling those correctly. Those become new training data. But we can also use VARs and Shark Dakota 2 to display machine learning proposals. So this would be an example of machine learning proposals that are being displayed to us. We can pause on a frame and edit and correct those as needed within the VARS interface. Again, either creating new training data or just validating those machine learning proposals. And here's an example of VARS grid view, which is another tool that we've developed that allows us to clean up the machine learning proposals. We can query our database for a different concept or a dive, pull up all the regions of interest and correct the box positioning and also the label of the box within this interface. And this, again, all works with our VARS database. All of this, once cleaned up, can become new training data. It can be funneled off to various uses like FathomNet. And then we've also integrated a machine learning model into the VARS interface so that uh, as we're doing our annotations, we can stop on a frame, click a button, and it sends that frame to the machine learning uh, model for inference. And then we're presented with a view of that uh, proposal like this. We can either edit that or save it or delete it as we see fit. That again becomes more annotations in the database and more training data. It's pretty, this was sort of the tool that sort of we integrated and it blew everybody's minds <laughs> that this actually works. Uh, so we tested this whole workflow recently um, on 18 dives from the Pacific Northwest. It was 135 hours, and that generated 200,000 localizations. Um, it took about five days of compute time on Amazon uh, Web Services and cost about $300.
And then in addition to that, it took about four months uh, human time to validate those. And we've got about five people doing analysis in the video lab, but I, it was mostly me doing this cleanup work and a little bit of time from another person. And those weren't full days either. So, um, you know, this process is greatly sped up through the machine learning pipeline. Um, the other thing to note at the bottom there, you know, our annotators now at this point in time are really analyzing about 140 hours of video per year just because of all the other tasks that we're doing. Um, we just can't keep up with the workflow. But you can see in a very short amount of time, we got 135 hours analyzed. So, um, you know, the cost benefit an analysis of incorporating this into your workflow is such that, you know, it's going to speed things up for you and it's going to reduce your costs immensely. And we just uh, also just ran a very short uh, collection dive in Monterey Bay. Uh, it was just one dive, but it created about 6,000 annotations and it took just days to clean up. So uh, this process for us is speeding up really, really quickly. Another project that I wanted to share is Pisivore Cam. And the major goal of Pisivore Cam is to study marine predators in the open ocean. We're using a long range AUV with forward and aft mounted video cameras and an attractor, basically like a, a fishing pole with uh, an attractor on the end of it to see if we can get predators to come in and, and investigate. Um, we record the entire daylight portion of these seven to 10 day missions, um, which results in about 200 hours of high definition video per deployment. Um, and they're about 300 kilometer long surveys and we record a variety of physical data along with the video as well. But the PI for this project basically had the, had the question, how can I rapidly find the really good parts? What he was doing in the past was sort of thumbing through the videos frame by frame, trying to find the instances where tuna or sharks or birds came into the frame, and he wanted to speed that up. And so we came up with this process that allows us to rapidly iterate through uh, ML training models, with each uh, deployment, I would gather new data, put that back into the training set, clean it up, and then retrain the model. And we, in a very short amount of time, we got a really good performing model. We run that model one frame per second and save the crops. And then I just came up with a script that would allow me to put those crops into a web page along with the video information. So I can very, very quickly go through all the crops find the interesting points in time and send that to the PI. And, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty easy. These crops, we end up with about 10,000 observations, but it takes about eight hours for a human to go through those. It's uh, a pretty fast process now. Anyways, in 2023, we had uh, 10 missions that we deployed for a total of 65 days. We surveyed over 2,000 kilometers inside and outside Monterey Bay. We found 11 species of fish including sharks and tuna and salmon, four species of mammals, a lot of birds. And again, this isn't quantitative. This is really just find it, trying to find the needle in the haystack, but it's very rapid processing of a lot of data. It takes about 24 hours for the machine learning model to run. And again, about eight hours for a human to go through the results. And here's just an example of some of the things that we're seeing. The AUV that we're using is on the right there. And um, you know we're seeing jellies, birds, sharks. Uh, the model's able to detect birds in flight, birds underwater, and birds bobbing around at the sea surface when we can only see their feet. So it works quite well. We see schools of fish as well, big schools of anchovies and things like that. It's been pretty, pretty successful. So to sum that up, uh, this project has allowed us to develop a process for rapid model iteration and improvement. In 2023, we processed about 600 hours of footage. In 2024, we plan to integrate this with our uh, VARS system so that all that data is preserved and logged and uh, merged with the physical data that's collected. And then eventually those, uh, those localizations will be available for training data for both uh, Ambari and FathomNet. So with that, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. And I'm going to hand it over to Angus to describe FathomNet a little, FathomNet, FathomGPT a little bit more, 
And again, just be thinking about how uh, we can help you with this work. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lonnie. Um, I don't have any more slides to present other than what I presented before, but I wanted to make sure that all the marine researchers have the link to Fathom GPT so they can play around with it. And um, I do have some questions about uh, how you might use a tool like Fathom GPT. Obviously, the OVAI ecosystem, the Fathom ecosystem has a lot of models and a lot of tools and a lot of kind of offshoots. Um, but I obviously am a believer that these natural language GPT like interfaces are very powerful. And although there's tons of hype about them, they're still underexplored, especially for scientific contexts, especially for this uh, you know, marine science context. So I'm very uh, curious to know, or just have, maybe have a conversation about how uh, the, the prototype that I shared with you might be um, how you might use it or how you, how you could imagine using it. If the features that are where I, I showed already don't quite do what you want it to do, what would you like it to do? What types of prompts would you like to be able to enter in? And what types of results would you like to be able to get from that? Um, in addition to the, uh, the, um, the prototype itself, uh, which I think I mentioned before, is just running right now on a lab server at, in, in Indiana. Um, it's, it, we're hoping to get some feedback and especially to get some examples of real world use cases that we can use to, to uh, make the, the project more robust and then uh, host it uh, at Ambari or wherever the other Fathomnet servers are located so that we can um, release it publicly. Um, and so that would be helpful to get some feedback from you. I don't want to put everyone on the spot. Um, I do. And maybe it's too tired. <laughs> I'm a little tired. It's it's uh, almost nine o'clock here, or it's eight eight p.m. here, nine o'clock for my students in Indiana because of the central to eastern time zone. Um, but yeah, I, I can just share some of the questions that I'm specifically curious about. Um, uh, basically, how could a tool like Fathom GPT support your research? Um, or can you imagine a situation where it could? Uh, I mean, I'm hoping the answer is yes, it could, and it would be transformative. But if not, why not? What are some features that could be added so that it would actually be useful? Um, I'm specifically interested, as I said, in hearing about some potential use cases for doing exploratory research or for doing more specified um, analysis of the data that's in FathomNet. Um, I, Lonnie and I have, need to have a conversation at some point. It's long overdue. Is there a pipeline for getting the, the VARS data into FathomNet or more specifically into Fathom GPT? Um, even just being able to search, look for trash in FathomNet was very was interesting. I'd never tried that before, but as these models come online, we can start adding more concepts to Fathom GPT. Um, and then, you know, as my re re research primarily or at least up until last year, was in data visualization. And I was really excited by the fact that GPT is intelligent enough to create code that renders custom interactive visualizations on the fly just based on a prompt and some fine tuning. Um, and it doesn't work perfectly yet, but the fact that you know we can enter a query we'd never thought of before to look for the depth distribution of a particular species, and it returned accurate results in 20 seconds. Um, I think is pretty exciting, um, but I imagine different researchers have different visualization needs. And if it, they're not supported out of the box, again, we could fine tune our system to support different types of visualization. So another question I have in that form is asking about what types of visualization do you use in your work and do you refer to, or do you use to, to showcase the results of your work? And, um, would it be useful to try and support those in this kind of interactive uh, GPT-like way? And then lastly, um, we, talked about, we talked about how we're kind of pre-setting um, pre our GPT interface to know about certain concepts. It knows about some just because GPT knows about everything, like it knows what scary means apparently, I didn't realize that, but we've fine-tuned to know about, you know, 
more different uh, morphological features. Um, obviously, the taxonomic feature is already inside of the FathomNet database. Uh, some work needs to be done there to make them a little more stable um, on our part, not on FathomNet's part. Uh, so we're, we're able to look for color and certain other features like bioluminescence and translucence, which are pretty cool. But what other concepts would be useful? I think someone mentioned predator prey. We're, we can already do that to some extent. But are there other concepts that are useful for your particular research? I mean, there's no reason that if you're a marine scientist who studies, I don't know, the interaction of, you know, sea mammals with other, uh, you know, sea urchins. I have no idea. But that we couldn't use that as an example and and uh, and fine tune those types of things. Or someone mentioned earlier this today that they wanted to be able to describe the motion of certain animals, that those motions were, that's what they study. So they would like to be able to describe things by motion to retrieve images. That's something I had never thought about. So yeah, just throwing it out there to know if there's anything specific to your line of research or analysis that you would like to be able to type in in plain English to get some results back, either from kind of an exploratory point of view or from a more rigorous analytics and analysis point of view. So I'll just start, I guess. Um, I went and talked to my lab mates like in between sessions and uh, told them about Fathom GPT and they were just like ecstatic, like, oh my God, I want to use it for this and I want to use it for that. So I think we do need to have a sit down and let people ask you what we can do with it. But I, I love the idea of being able to sort of ask questions of the data itself. I think that's that's really cool you know, to make the, the visualizations and things like that. That's just wonderful. Um, and some of the ideas that people had were, you know, a common thing, like show me all the orange fish or show me all the black fish. And that might be used in a context of trying to find the uh, identity of a species. So you might want to be presented with all the black fish so that you can hone down your search to figure out what species you're looking at in any given video or image set. Mm -hmm. Um, I also like the idea of like, I think you showed a rockfish at one point, it would be really interesting if you could do show me all the rockfish, but all the rockfish that have stripes. Mm -hmm. So is that, that kind of incorporates that pattern matching maybe? Yeah, that wouldn't necessarily, I mean, if stripes are only in some rockfish, then that wouldn't be characterized by the, uh, the descriptive language that's found in Wikipedia or worms, I don't think. Mm -hmm, so right. that's where we would, it might be useful to actually be able to click on a type of pattern or to um, have a, uh, um, a model that supports kind of a, a language uh, a visual embedding simultaneously so we can refer to them through language or through image. I, I think something like that could be really useful for identifying species for sure. Does anyone else have any comments, questions? <laughs> and if you don't have any comments now, you know, the link is up, it should work. If it stalls out for any reason, just press new chat or press refresh on your browser. Um, we're still tweaking some things. Again, it's running locally on, on a, a lab machine, but you should, I would love you to play with it and to provide some feedback either by emailing me directly or emailing anyone in this group or by using that uh, Google uh, form I just posted here. I see Paul has their hand up. Yeah, that, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, like, I was I'm, I'm currently playing around with the uh, GPT. Um, by the images, is it possible to add the location of where the image from? So, for example, my idea of what what I would use it for is like, for example, if I have a query of I want to find a particular group of worms or particular like reforming worms or uh, current favorite is a Timopterus. And so then I want to see, okay, where in the world are they uh, actually distributed? So that I can they say, okay, like we have in, in the Northern Pacific a population, we have a population by Australia, we have, and so on. And therefore I can then describe, okay, we have them around the world as possibly all the whole genius or just particular species. And therefore like we can, there from this crowd, give a uh, question like how these populations are connected later on? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, right now, the concept of location or environment is if it's in 
the worms database or in wikipedia it should have some knowledge of that or if ChatGPT just has already been trained on some of that data by happenstance it will know that certain species live in certain regions uh, there is a kind of an inherent mapping towards certain um, marine regions and longitude and latitude so it's already able to do that translation um, but to do the more specific lookups or kind of visualization creations, it, the data needs to be in FathomNet. So the FathomNet images, as far as I know, a lot of it is localized around uh, Monterey Bay, but it's but there's also images throughout the world. But I'm not sure if there's enough images of, I think you said sea worms, uh, uh, available to do that type of analysis right now. But as we collect more data and as more data is annotated and stored in FathomNet, Yes, we should. I would. I would love to. You know, talk to you more and figure out exactly what you're trying to do. But it sounds like you're trying to figure out the distribution of a particular species or a particular order or genus or something like that. And I'm not sure what else. But yes, th those types of things are should be possible. We will probably need to fine tune our GPT model in order to make it easy for a prompt to be translated into the right SQL query. Otherwise, you might have to do what you saw me do, like ask it a few different ways before it returns something meaningful. But um, that's precisely the kind of use cases we're looking for. Um, so yes, it depends on the data that's in FathomNet, but it also depends on maybe just talking to you and getting a clear idea of what exactly you're looking for and what type of prompts you'd be asking. And then we could support that. Like oh, I was gonna add that this, this also brings to mind, right? The idea of different data sources to fine tune the model and you know fathomnet contains the lat long in some cases contains the lat long of where the images were taken but we've also hooked up in marine re uh, to the marine regions api and that allows you to kind of distinguish where are those lat long locations within like natural language regional locations um and so that might be you know looking at that api and hooking that up to um fine tune fathom gpt will i think make a lot of sense yeah some of that should already be supported um mm -hmm. i'm not sure if amy one of my students amy who wrote the knowledge graph has already used that particular data set but i do know you can search by particular regions mm -hmm. using natural language okay like some places at least sorry go ahead Paul. just just to go flick in the my like i would flip it around my interesting like obviously could be go just to say okay um gpt give me a map of this genius or this family or whatever this order and the di distribution around the world so like that this gpt actually could my do my work in this pad rather than that i go to 100 people and say okay this is true this is not true this is a species that gpt on the, on the end finally can give me like literally like a map saying okay we found the species here here and here and then in case where I don't trust, actually, it can go then in and say, okay, yeah, this makes sense or not. Oh, I hear what you're saying. So you're assuming GPT has some base knowledge, which may yeah. or may not be perfectly accurate, but at least it provides a baseline. And then you could use the more you know fine-tuned version that's trained on empirical data that we know about uh, and then verify it or investigate it. Yeah, that's a great idea. But, but I think that already is enabled now. So I th you, you showed, right, a prompt, Angus, where it was like, show me all the the animals in monterey bay and you could that, refine that sorry to interrupt that was that was look that was all the instances within fathomnet itself so that so i think what he said what i mean is like you would query fathomnet for that information you could already do that prompt now the problem is right we don't have global distribution of, of data yet that would would mm -hmm. fill out that query for you paul so and ask your friends to contribute their data to FathomNet. <laughs> yeah, so there's kind of a chicken and egg problem, but yep. per perhaps before we gather all the data into FathomNet, there's some strategies to um, enable the type of search that um, Paul is talking about. Maybe, yeah, I'd love to feel, please in the form, if you even just wanna put your email and mention your name and you're willing to for me to reach out to you, just even if it's something simple, we could continue this conversation for sure. Thanks. Claire, you have your hand raised. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is exactly what you're you're looking for, Angus, but 
Um, so I work on the Deepwater Horizon, Mesophotic and Deep Ethnic Communities Restoration Portfolio. So there's like 13 restoration areas underneath the Deepwater Horizon Restoration and Mesophotic and Deep Ethnic Communities is just one, one small one. Um, but my job title is Threat Reduction Coordinator. So one of my jobs within that is building a database, um, which at this point is just like sort of a glorified spreadsheet of different threats in the Gulf of Mexico to, to Mesophotic and Deep Ethnic Communities. Um, so I feel like if like Fathom that GPT or Fathom, yeah, could fully be useful to me, I wouldn't have the job that I have because that is sort of what I'm supposed to be doing. But I, I'm thinking like, you know, as FathomNet grows, it would be cool to be able to query data from FathomNet through Fathom GPT. Sorry, I keep forgetting the, the names of everything, but your tool. Um, and yeah, getting, getting potential like threats data, like marine debris and reviewing it and adding it to my database. Um, and then I'm thinking like, once I have this sort of database in its most final form, if that could be integrated into, into FathomNet and people could query it using a tool like this, that would be, you know, a much more publicly friendly, I guess, way to, to have that database stored. So that's how I'm thinking right now would be the, the sort of best application. But I don't know that I have anything where it's like this tool doesn't do it now and I wish it did. It's more just like, it seems like it maybe is more concentrated on the West Coast. Um, but you know, I definitely am going to to try to yeah to see what how I can use it at the moment as well. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, I mean, I also think that this cool this tool could be used as kind of a public facing interface to the scientific database. I think it could be exciting for people to put this in some kind of interactive uh, installation context or museum context. And I I know some of the folks working in the portal and Kakani, of course, have, we've talked about this. Um, and that would be one angle to go. And I'm also interested in supporting any data that ends up being ingested in FathomNet. And, uh, you know, you'd have to talk to Kakani or some of the other folks in this meeting. I don't quite know how new data with different types of metadata about threat would be integrated into FathomNet. Maybe Kakani could speak to that. Um, well, I, I think so. I'm going to give you a. Um... I'm just looking for our blog post that describes how you submit data to to fathom it in case people here are curious um you know what what we require is um you know an image a name of an of the object and a localization of the object um and that information is submitted by uh, via a csv file um the format of which is described in the um the medium or the blog post that i just shared um, there's additional metadata that can be submitted as part of the contribution, um, but it's not metadata that we're requiring. Um, so I just told you at a very a bare minimum, it's the UR locate, URL location of the image, um, the object, and the, the the bounding box location. But additional metadata could be lat long, um, it could be depth, it could be salinity and temperature, um, it could be keywords that you might be using to describe. Uh, the animal or the observation, like, is this animal involved in a predation event, whatever. So the FathomNet can accommodate that data. Um, and then because it is metadata stored in the FathomNet database, then Fathom GPT can, can query it. I don't know if that answers your question, um, but I think that's a, a helpful explainer on how, how to uh, submit data to FathomNet. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I didn't really have a, a question, I suppose. But um, yeah, that's definitely good to know that process. And yeah, there are other threats that it probably wouldn't apply to as much. But a couple of the main ones are marine debris and then also lionfish in the in the Gulf of Mexico, at least. Mm -hmm. So um, for those two. That'd yeah. be excellent. Yeah, we would love to get, you know, data in other ocean basins uh, yeah. or other places than just uh, Monterey Bay, right? I think that's the goal. Yeah, I know we have a lot of rules on sharing our imagery and stuff publicly, so I would have to like navigate that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, the Thanks. other thing may, that I'll just plug here since we have um, people is if I go to About Us, data use policy. Um, I think it's also worth looking at the data use policy that we have for uh, FathomNet. Um, it took a lot for us to get a number of institutions, including mine, to be open to make their images public. And it's this data use policy that has enabled that. So 
you could see how we're, you know, threading this needle of making images um, accessible, but only being able to be used for a particular use case, like training machine learning models. Um, and so, yeah, happy to discuss offline if, if there are ways that we can um, enable that contribution. Cool, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, there was a question in the chat, but I don't really understand. I don't know when it came in, and so I don't really know the context. Um, with this, will this ML be part of the unknown Kaggle competition? I, I feel, hopefully, they're still here and they can give us. Nope. <laughs> Never mind. Um, any other thoughts? We only get to meet once a year, so um, speak now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for me, I just have a question for um, like the folks that are currently on the call. And um, would you say there are any barriers in you kind of using FathomNet or AI in your like research work? Um, is there anything in particular like that would be useful? Um, so I know like our team has definitely brainstormed in the past of ways that we can help people either, um, uh, we have many resources already available like our blog and, and tutorials and stuff like that on how to like put your data into Fathom then and whatnot. But yeah, I'm just really curious to see if there are any barriers that might prevent you from using, you know, AI or like FathomNet in, in your research work, if any. Along those lines, I'm just curious, has everybody created an account with FathomNet, logged in, looked at the data, kind of interacted with the website, done some queries? Have you downloaded any data? What are your thoughts? Paul. It's good to uh, see you, by the way, Paul. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, good that you make it like a way bit in a, a New Zealand friendly time. Um, the, I believe in the last couple of workshops, we, we spoke about this issue that Phantom, Net, like as you highlighted, Phantom Net is mainly currently limited to the Northern Pacific, uh, or like more like the Yugas area. And um, therefore, it's like, um at the moment not much use in new zealand so like uh, uh kakani and i we spoke a couple of times about like to get it to new zealand and like i tried with different uh, government organizations like a couple of times of discussion to get it here um so yeah in generic it's like there is not much use like it, if you like my query is then like in regarding to the Cal californian coastline would be like literally like the specific species which random net cannot provide because it would be like then uh for example look at one particular non-native species or one particular taxa and i believe with um in the last workshops amongst taxonomists we agreed that most of the identification may be mainly only to family level if i remember correctly mm. so on their first i yes. i don't uh, I don't know if that's true. Um, I think it depends, right, on the context of the the visual data that's been collected. I know oh, yeah. some people okay. that say that you know maybe you can do genus level IDs, but if you're in a place where, like in Monterey Bay, where we've we've sampled a lot, so we we know okay. from these images that that things are labeled to species and it's accurate. Um, okay. But as a mechanism, right, to do a species discovery or species description, there's, as far as I know, only like one paper that has used only visual data to do that. Yeah. Um, so it is definitely not widely, uh, the widely accepted approach for sure. But I didn't hear what you said, Paul, about FathomNet not being able to accommodate species. Can you say that again? Right, like if we if we're talking about like accommodate species, like the species identification, obviously we would then discuss a, a different like or if we're going down to the species identification. Um, I agree. Certain fishes probably you can identify to species level, certain snails or mollusks as well. 
five rooms, for example, I would have my issues to say because like AI would probably have issues to recognize certain bursts or appendages on footage. Mm -hmm. So and therefore, like they're both up, uh, might might be only the discussion with Leslie and Karen last time that we said, okay, at least by polycase, possibly it's like only going down to family level. However, like the use now is like what I'm saying is um in general, like I would use new uh or like it discussed in New Zealand context to use AI or particular phantom net to have an initial assessment of biodiversity. We have around 300, something between 330 to 550 biogenic habitats. Uh, apparently in New York Times, uh, you guys had like currently a report from New Zealand where Ocean Census and uh, NEVA did a survey of uh, one particular area of New Zealand and they found 100 species. Um, basically uh, every, uh, I would say every 30 habitats you, you're surveying from these 330 to 500, you'll find at least 100 new species undescribed. And therefore, like this fan, like um, there is now the concern by government or, or organizations that, like, if we're doing an invasive, but like taking samples of this habitat, we will actually already destroy the habitat or interrupt the habitat without even knowing what's there. So and therefore, was a question like is ideas of like using AI to go down the our way. Like, I've currently project pot potentially project running with a certain council where they just want to have the footage and then in the future we could then use ai actually to identify okay these species are like these are non-native these taxa and these taxa and yeah. from there on you can go further yeah i mean i think that's the idea right is is yeah. for some people or some use cases you can use visual data as a non-invasive way to sample the region and Fathomnet doesn't require you to ID things to species level. You can yeah. um, create your annotation at, at whatever level that you are confident in in the ID. Um, but then again, right, there isn't a resource right now that's easily searchable and accessible where you can enrich that taxonomic information or correct it or change it. And so that's what we're trying to create with Fathomnet. Um, and so again, I mean, the the nice thing at least we're starting with these super category detectors sharing them with the community. And we're finding even on data that it's not trained on yet, like in out of distribution cases, that they perform relatively well enough. Um, we're not saying they're perfect, but as a starting point, this is like, you know, I, I would say a monumental starting point for people who don't even have training data to begin with. And so that's part of what we're trying to build with FathomNet and the FathomNet community. I don't know if anyone has anything else they want to add to that. But. Well, I just wanted to say, as long as they're visibly discernible in the images, these models will find those things. And as an example, with the super categories, if we've lumped all the worms into a, a worms category, it's going to find those worms unless they're not visible. But if they're cyclaglided worms, if they're osidax on a whale fall, it's going to find them. If it's uh, riftia at a hydrothermal vent, it's going to find those. Uh, it might have a hard time with like small dorbelids and things like that, but it's going to find, you know, serpulids. It's going to find um, pretty much any more worms that we put in the model. Yeah, I think the, the, the species ID, right, is really an aspirational goal. I think over time, you know, as we have more and more information, that, that might be a realization in more places. But we're not we're not there yet. Um, but that's you know how do we get to that point? Well, we need to be sharing this information, making it accessible, etc. But Thanks. great point. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else? I guess um, I'll go again. Uh, I mean, this is pretty basic. And I also, I hadn't heard of Fathom Met today until someone shot me some info about this workshop. So I haven't looked through any of your, your resources, but um, pretty simply, like, I feel like I just don't have that much knowledge about AI or machine learning. I have a little bit of a programming background, like related to sort of biology studies and things like that. But uh, yeah, I guess I just feel like it's a really complicated landscape and just, knowing 
how to proceed and for example like using the trash model and knowing how to you know check, like use it on the data that i have and making sure it like is works for the purposes of like adding those data to the threat database that i was mentioning before um yeah just i guess like a lack of knowledge about the details on how to proceed and it feels like even sort of the data oriented people on my team also don't necessarily have like AI or machine learning knowledge. It, it overall just like kind of has felt like a sort of a black box to me for a long time. Yeah. Um, and you're not the only person we've heard this from. Um, when we did, we did a lot of user-centered design interviews. Uh, I think it involved like more than 35 or 40 people across various areas, either in academia, uh, commercial, nonprofit, um, um, and other spaces. Uh, there's kind of this this overall um, sentiment, right, that that AI is largely a black box that we don't understand, and so that is um, kind of, I think that's something that we're trying to dispel or explain more through the Ocean Vision AI program, um, okay. because it isn't necessarily black box. There are, are there's actually a lot of explanations, a lot of expertise out there. Um, that is accessible that people can learn from, but it's just not readily available uh, to the community. Um, so for instance, one of the big things that we're making and you know, it's not ready yet to share with the community, but is something I mentioned earlier is is the portal. Um, the idea being, you know, trying to take out the 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 data, the need for like a, a computer science degree to run some of these models and train models and and fine tune them. And so the idea of the portal is that we can provide access to these really powerful uh, data pipelines with machine learning or with AI, um, but then allow people to understand what the outputs are, uh, understand what goes into the models and and then also understand the right the data that's coming out. Um, so I mean I agree this is a, a common issue or a common thing that we've heard from a lot of different people. The other thing I want to say too is that you know there's a lot of assumptions, there's different, depending on who we talk to, we get very different assumptions about how performative these models are. Um, interestingly, the, the individuals I spoke with at, at government related institutions all think machine learning works out of the box and is going to solve all of their data problems, <laughs> and, which is weird because well, I don't know where that comes from. And I don't know if it's just because people are trying to sell a particular solution to these agencies. But what we know is that isn't true. It takes a lot of iterative work and improvements to get to a place where you have a model that reliably spits out data that can address your scientific needs. Um, but models are getting better and better. Some are generalizing really well. I mean, you just saw Angus's example with, with ChatGPT. It works relative well, well, relatively well in some prompts. It fails miserably in others. And so understanding when these systems fail, hey. prove them. <laughs> Sorry, Angus. Uh, over time is really what you need to do uh, to make a um, you know effective um, AI program or pipeline. I'm sure anyone else can 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 jump in here, but. Sorry, Angus, I didn't mean to call it just chat. Just Fails miserably. No, it's true. It does. It needs some fine tune. It needs some massaging and some more use cases, basically, from different people who are using the data. And uh, I think that's the issue with, like you mentioned, AI isn't magic. I mean, it's kind of magical, but it won't work as intended unless you know what it's being used for. You basically need to collect lots of data in order for it to work. And the data is not just the raw data, but it's also how people interact with the data and use the data. And that's the data that's harder to get. But that's the data that's I think is ultimately maybe more useful because then you, you know, you can train on that those those examples, and then hopefully it will generalize to a wider uh, set of use cases. Yeah, yeah, no, that definitely, um, yeah, that makes sense. I will say I was we were sort of in a, a bit of the opposite position where. <laughs> We thought we sort of did a brief search for any, and marine debris again is the main sort of thing that's applicable to my work. Um, but we looked out there for any people that were working on, yeah, any like marine debris identification models. And for whatever reason, we we didn't come across the the FathomNet model. And this was also like a little bit ago, so maybe that's why. Um, so we thought we were at the very beginning where we were like, there's almost it doesn't seem like there's even any training data because people don't tend to annotate marine debris. Like it doesn't seem like anybody has started this process of sort of like 
So anyway, it, it, we thought it was sort of going to be, we were starting from scratch. So it, I will say it's very good to know that suddenly we're a lot farther than we thought we were with maybe being able to use this in our work. Yeah, and I think too, take a look at that trash model because as Lonnie you know, said, he pulled data from a lot of different sources, not just from FathomNet to train it. And then in his demo, he showed how the, the model performs on, again, out of distribution data. So random video or imagery that he collected on the internet. And you could see already a, a really excellent starting point using, using those models. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm, yeah, very, very excited about that trash model. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Cool. Get in touch. Yeah. Any other, any other thoughts? I mean, this is all helpful to us. The more you know, feedback we get from you all, then we we know what are the things we should be improving upon or focusing on for the next year. We heard a lot from Claire and Paul. So if there's anyone else in this group that wants to speak up, that would be great. Does anyone feel like the um, marine researchers sessions need to sort of provide you with more advanced information about these models and how they work and how you can use them? Like is, is your knowledge of how to use these models, is that a roadblock to getting you to actually start using these and labeling data? And, or do you feel like you have all the information you, you need? Claire added something in the chat about how she would like to learn more. Yeah, because Giovanna and I were talking about this last week that, you know, it might be nice for the Marine Research Group to sort of get a little bit more of an advanced lesson on how to use these models and how to train models and things like that, just to you mean like to a tutorial? as opposed to an overview, like a hands-on tutorial. So they know. Yeah, more of a hands-on type of tutorial, just so they have a better understanding of how they can actually put these things to work for themselves. I know we we did that, or a little bit of that, in the very first FathomNet workshop um, that worked relatively well. But I think you might want to set aside a day and then you know prompt people to bring their own data Mm -hmm. And then we could, you know, set them up prior to um, that workshop discussion and have them train a model, run a model, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that's when sort of, it wasn't until I showed everybody in the lab, like, this is what the models can do, that they're, the light bulb went off and they were like, oh my God, I want to use this all the time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that same thing could happen here with this group. Yeah. Okay, well... Um, I need to close all the rooms. Um, I'll see you all uh, back in the other space.